Uh, morning, church. We're reading John 3, verse 1 to 18. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, Andrea, uh, for reading the teaching text for us. Thank you, Meryl, for leading us in worship. Thank you, Morandini, for hosting us like a champion. Uh, it has been a really, really beautiful service so far. I'm just excited, in awe, loving it. Guys, today's part 10 of our current series called I Am Who I Am. Um, we've been a long time, well, the course of 10 weeks, looking at God, who He is, His characteristics, the acts of God, His love, and his presence. And this series of 10 weeks was meant to renew your commitment to Christ, to revitalize your life of faith, and to have you stand in awe of God and how wonderful he is. So we spent time looking at Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, who's got a name. We spent time looking at Jesus, who is Yahweh, who became a human being. And then over the last five weeks, we've only spoken about the Holy Spirit, and today will be the sixth week. It's quite a tongue twister, that one. I always struggle with that. Sixth. So over the last five weeks, we've spoken about the Spirit as a life giver. We've spoken about the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. We've spoken about the Spirit, suffering and prayer, how the Spirit is present when we suffer and when we pray. We've spoken about the Spirit as a voice of love, and we've spoken about the Spirit and the temple, saying that you are God's temple because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. The theme for today is up on the screen, and that is born of the Spirit. Now, not only is this a really interesting Christian phrase, it is something that is really profound and crucial to our lives as followers of Jesus. We need to get this, and we need to love this, and we need to experience this. We currently live in a time of more motivational and inspirational content than ever before. Why? Because there's a demand for it. Why? Because people long to change. People long for more. People want more. People need more. You've heard that it was said that people don't like change. 
And that might be true in some circumstances, but definitely not when it comes to our innermost being and the things of the heart. None of us can say this morning that we are going inside. I'm really content with where I am, and I don't long for more. We always long for more. This is a slide. It's a screenshot of the website of a guy called Jay Shetty. The only reason why I chose him this morning is because Jay Shetty records videos and writes blogs, and they often pass through my WhatsApp as people forward it on groups. Can I have the visual, please, Rudolf? That's really, really great. Here's how Jay can help. Coaching, courses, a book, a podcast, and some speaking. Right? We live in a time where there's a lot of people like him trying to motivate and inspire people to change. I don't have anything against him. I just took a screenshot of his website to show you. Look at some Google searches I ran. So if we typed in, how do I reinvent myself? You'll see that there's uh, seven easy steps just in the first search, right? Wake up early, prioritize your tasks, learn, find a mentor, etc. I ran some more Google searches, uh, related questions on Google. Rudolf, if I can have the next one, please. People also ask, right? So the same people who ask, how do I reinvent myself? Also ask, what does it mean to reinvent yourself? How do you reinvent yourself physically, how do you reinvent yourself at work, and how can I reinvent my looks? So those searches show that this is quite a popular topic. You've got 15 steps if you've won for the long haul. You've got seven if you are strained for time. And then you see there's three ways to reinvent yourself if you are in a hurry and you need instant change. There's also five steps and four steps if the three steps doesn't work. Next slide, please. You also see down here that there's categories for reinvention. 30 and 40 and 50 and 60, right? A hot topic because people long for change. Question, how do we get it? Who's right of all of these blogs? And whose steps work best? I would like to put it to you that if Jesus was here this morning thinking of the teaching text we just read, he would simply answer, you have to be born of the Spirit. If we ask, if we ask these questions to Jesus and he was here in the flesh, he would say, you have to be born of the Spirit. Our teaching text is a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. You can take that down for me. Thank you, Rudolf. In John chapter 1, John says, this is who Jesus is. He is the Word. He is God. And He came to dwell among us. Do not mistake Him for anything else than God Himself. In chapter 2, Jesus cleanses the temple. And by that, the writer John in his book shows that God is not to be found in the temple anymore. God is to be found in Jesus Himself. And then he gets to chapter 3, and he writes this story of this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus' name means the conqueror of the people, right? So this really strong guy who belonged to the Pharisees, who was on the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, the really powerful, wealthy, influential, clever guy, who's got a lot of status in his community, comes to Jesus, and he has a conversation with him. Now, Nicodemus comes to Jesus wanting something from him. Nicodemus, Nicodemus doesn't come to Jesus thinking of change or deep introspection or starting over. Nicodemus knows, right? If we could have been able to ask Nicodemus, dude, how are you doing just before this conversation? He would say to you, I'm doing quite fine, to be honest. I've got everything sorted, and I'm really clever, and I'm actually a teacher of the law of God. So if you want to have an example of an upstanding citizen, that's me. I'm not going to Jesus to ask for change. I'm going to Jesus as a power play because he's got something and I've got something. And if we work together, then we can both achieve our goals. That's why he went to Jesus. He talks three times. Jesus answers him three times. And we're going to work through this portion of Scripture quickly, I promise, by looking at these three questions. What does it mean to be born of the Spirit? How do we get born of the Spirit? And why should we get born of the Spirit? Do you guys see it? So the what, the how, and the why. First, let's look at what does it mean to be born of the Spirit. We find this in verses 2 and 3. Nicodemus says, and then Jesus says. And here's what Jesus says. I'm going to explain it in really, really simple terms. You need to start again. And the source of that restart will come from a different place, not from within yourself, your own efforts, or your own understanding. That's what he says. 
So none of your ways, none of your thinking, none of your religion, none of your culture will bring this forth. It starts from outside. And you need to start over. That's what Jesus says to him. And guys, that's what it means to be born of the Spirit. So those of you who have known me to be a preacher for quite some time, like that's the whole point. Okay, I know that you're expecting a 10-minute explanation. That's the point. What does it mean to be born of the Spirit? It means that you start over, completely, from the beginning. Not wanting to work your own ways, your own understanding of life and importance and values and what have you into it. You start over. Second question. How do we get born of the Spirit? Now you're going to have to look at verses 4 all the way to 13, because that's the part of our teaching text in which Jesus answers these questions. So what happens in our teaching text is Jesus absolutely ignores what Nicodemus said. And then Nicodemus goes, okay, so we are going to do this little dance now. It seems like you would like to argue. I can actually argue quite well myself. So let's argue then. And then he asks Jesus, how is it possible? Uh, surely it cannot be that you can be born again and that you can enter back into your mom. We saw that in the teaching text. And then Jesus answers him with this absolute rapper. Unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water, outside. Spirit, inside. That's what Jesus teaches. You have to start over, not only by changing your ways outside by religious means. You have to start over by changing from the inside as well. And once you change on the inside, someone and something else is in control. That's why Jesus uses wind as a metaphor in verse 8. Do you guys see? So how do we get born of the Spirit? Well, we change outside and we change inside. We start over outside and we start over inside. And once we start over outside and inside, we allow something, which is the Holy Spirit, to move us around as He pleases. You guys know every single radio advertisement says at the end, T's and C's apply. This is God's T's and C's that apply to the life of a believer. And that's a hard word for Nicodemus to hear because Nicodemus loves his life. Like he wants to continue on that course. Now Jesus says to him, dude, firstly, you have to start over. Secondly, it's not only outside stuff that you fix. You need deep, deep, deep transformation and change on the inside. And once you get that deep transformation on the inside, you don't call the shots. The Spirit calls the shots. And not in a linear way, but like the wind. You can tell that it's there. You know that it's blowing. You can determine its direction, but you will not tell the wind what to do. I mean, has anyone ever been successful in that? We can't. On the contrary, there's really nothing as fleeing as the experience of just standing in the wind and having it blow through your hair. And if you don't have hair, having it blow over your scalp. Right? Or whatever it is that it blows through at that point. Why Jesus says this is because he says what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. Jesus says to him, you might be able to change your outsides, but no one will be able to change your inside except God himself. Only God can give you a new heart. Like all the testimonies we saw on video today said God did something inside of me at a critical point in my life and it changed everything for me. That's way more than just outward change. And I believe the reason I started with my screenshots, that's the most discouraging thing about our reinvention culture and our motivating and inspiration culture. You will not find there what you are looking for. Because any human plan will have a human outcome. That's the problem. I'm not saying that you shouldn't read it, but you can't put all your chips on it, right? You can't depend on those three, four, five, six, seven, or 15 steps to bring forth the change that you really long for. Because it'll just have a human outcome. It won't change the deepest part of you. Some of us might think that a work will change everything. Oh, a work. 
like a direct translation from Afrikaans. Your work, your work, your job. Some of us might think that job, or that a job, will change everything for you. It won't. Some of us might think that moving to a different town or city will change everything for you. It won't. Some of us might think having a spouse or being married or changing your spouse, if you are married, will change everything for you. I'm telling you now that it will not. Some of us in our current cultural climate might wish that we were a different gender or a different skin color. I put it to you, that also will not bring the change that you long for. The change that you long for can only be brought forth by the Spirit. Why? Can you guys imagine how self-righteous the kingdom of God would have been if any of us could say, this is how I entered the kingdom of God. Like, I did this myself, you know. Studied really hard, read a lot of scripture, never did sin, boom, and I was in. How about you? What was your three or four or five steps? The reason why only God can bring forth this regeneration and this revitalization in our lives is so that we can give Him the glory and so that none of us could ever say that we hold the keys to the access of the kingdom of God. Do you know how hard this word was for Nicodemus? Because Nicodemus was part of the Pharisees and the Pharisees believed that if we keep the law, like really keep the law, then we'll be able to enter the kingdom. Like, you guys think it's going to be by political power, and you guys think it's going to be by social and wealth. We are telling you now as the Pharisees, if you keep to the letter of the law, you will be in. And now Jesus says to him, you will not. You will not. And then the third question that Nicodemus asks is, how can this be? So what then must I do? Now, look at verses 12. 13 and 14. Because I think in 12, 13 and 14, there's really, really important questions for us to note. So Jesus says in verse 12, If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Let's just pause there for a second. If Jesus posed this question to you today, what would your answer be? Do you believe Jesus about earthly things? Do you actually believe that what this Bible says is true? Do you actually believe what this Bible calls us to is true? Do you actually believe what we saw today was God acting among his people? Because if you do, then you'll also believe what Jesus says next. But if you don't, this will just fall on really, 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 really hard ground. Verse 13, Jesus says, No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. How's that for a power play? Nicodemus, you think you've got access, dude. Can I tell you about my access? I'm the only one who has the access. I'm the only one that has the authority that could tell you about these things. And then in verse 14, Jesus drops this boot just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now for Nicodemus, he would have gone, for us, we might go, what? Snakes and wilderness. Let me help you. In Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9, there's a really strange story in the Bible. The story goes like this. The people of God were in the wilderness, they disobeyed, God got angry, and he released a whole plague of snakes among his people. The snakes started biting the people, they got sick, and they started dying. And then Moses consulted God and said, what shall we do now? And then God said, dude, make a snake, put it on a pole, lift up the pole, and tell people, listen to this, the only way that you can be saved is by looking up towards the snake. Like, that's the story. And now Jesus says to Nicodemus, it's actually quite simple. Remember, Nicodemus' last question to Jesus was, how can this be? Jesus answers and says, it's really simple. Just look up. Look up and look at me. There's no other way. Don't put ointment on it. Don't figure out a snake catching team. Don't try and poison those bad boys. Don't try and tame them. Leave them and look up at me. 
The source of your death will disappear the moment you turn your gaze to me. That's what Jesus says to Nicodemus. Now, to Nicodemus, that must have felt so strange. Because it's so free. And it's so easy. <laughs> Remember, Nicodemus is part of a party that made it more difficult to follow God and to keep his laws. And now Jesus goes directly in the opposite direction and says, dude, it's actually really easy. And you guys know what? It's a sign for us. That is how easy it is. If you want to be saved, look up at the Savior and receive salvation. That's what Jesus teaches Nicodemus. So how do we get born of the Spirit? Only two words, guys. I wish that I could blow your brains with more eloquent sentences. Look up. Turn away from what's going on down here and look up and gaze at the only one that could save you so that he can do the work of regeneration, that he can give you a new inside and out, that he can change you, and that he can blow you around like the wind. Third question, and then we'll land with this. I'm doing really well in terms of time. Self five. This is a humble self five. Definitely not a kind of a bragging or arrogant self five. You know what I mean? I'm joking. I'm joking. Why should we get born of the Spirit? I think this is a really, really important place for us to land, and that's also where Jesus lands his conversation with the conqueror of the people. Because that is God's heart for us. God's heart for us is that we would know him, look at verse 16, that we would have everlasting life and that we will not perish and why is that God's heart? Look at verse 17. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Like we often quote 316. Have you ever seen what a power, uh, uh, what a punch verse 17 also packs? Like we have to quote these two together. God's heart was never to condemn and to judge. God's heart was that we would live. And that's why we should be born of the Spirit. That's why He makes it so easy to start again. That's why He says, just look at me and death will leave you. Because that is what He wanted of us always. Listen, listen, listen. God doesn't want to give us life after death. God wants to take us from death to life. Do you guys see the difference? We often think that the whole gospel story is only about the day that I give God his final breath back. That's not what he wants to do in us. He wants to have us stop over. He wants to create something new in us. He wants to take us from death to life. He wants us not to perish. He wants us to live with him forever. And Jesus lands his conversation with Nicodemus by giving clarity about exactly what it is what God's heart is. Think about it. Nicodemus was headed in that way, thinking that God's heart is a heart of judgment, is a heart of wrath, is a heart of, um, uh, well, uh, what's the opposite of not having grace? Just a, like a hardened, punishing, judgmental heart. And Jesus says to him, you have to start over. You have to allow God to do that work inside of you. You have to relinquish control because it's always been his heart. Guys, think about this. You and I will live forever if you are a Christian. You and I are all our sins forgiven. You and I are children of God. You and I are heirs of his inheritance. You and I have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. You and I have gone from death to life. We heard some of those testimonies this morning. You and I don't walk in darkness, we walk in light. You and I carry an ID that no one can ever take away from us, and that is the mark with water, the fact that we are baptized and that we are marked as His. You and I are part of a new family of brothers and sisters. You and I have an ever, uh, uh, um, everlasting bank account, right? Where we deposit our, uh, um, our works and our deeds, and our faithfulness to God. Did we become so familiar with this that we have actually become unfamiliar with it? I'm just asking. Because I think we do. Dallas Willard says this, and I really, really enjoy this quote. He says, History has brought us to the point where the Christian message is thought to be essential 
uh, essentially, sorry, concerned only with how to deal with sin, with wrongdoing or wrong being and its effects. Life, our actual existence, is not included um, in what is now presented as the heart of the Christian message, or it is included only marginally. This is a really, really sad truth. Obviously, Willard doesn't argue for us to keep the status quo right. That is Willard is legit. He argues for, therefore, we should make the Christian message relevant to our whole lives again. Then we maybe forget God's wonderful heart and his love for us, but we fall into the trap of thinking that we should do it ourselves. Think about that. Whenever you want to... Uh, um, Grow in your faith whenever you want to serve God faithfully. We often fall in the trap of thinking that we have to do it ourselves. And we forget this beautiful rebirth and restart that the Spirit gives us. Let me show you a picture. This is a really, really, really fresh baby. Like we are talking right out of the oven fresh. We are talking about crisp, fresh. That baby was born a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes ago. So what shall that baby do? What can that baby do for him or herself? What, can, what control does that baby have over his or her life? Absolutely none. But the feeling we just got when we looked at that picture was a feeling of just think about the potential of what this kid could become. Just think about what lies ahead for this kid. Just think about the adventure of discovering your mom's voice or your dad's voice or your sibling's voice. Just think about the adventure of having that first squashed butternut and then making a mess of the whole place, you know? Just think of the adventure of the first step. Just think about the adventure of uh, being able to speak and learning a language. Think about all the first that this kid could have. That's the feeling we got when we looked at this child now. That's the feeling that Jesus has when he talks about people coming to faith. Start there. Start there. Without doing anything. And without having any control of your life. And then, let the Spirit work inside of you. You can only receive it and relinquish control or submit to it. You cannot do it yourself. So, why should we be born of the Spirit? The answer is really, really simple. So that we can truly love. And I think that's the message to all of us this morning. It's knowing that the Spirit revitalizes us, does a work of rebirthing in us, starts over with us, changes us inside and out, and we have the privilege of giving ourselves over to it with this guarantee that we will then live forever, we will not be condemned, we will be saved, because that is what Jesus wanted to do to us. I'm not too sure where this message lands for you this morning. Like, I can imagine where it lands for our regulars, but there's a lot of faces in front of me that I don't know. So I don't know your story, and I don't know your context. Meryl, can I ask you to come forward for us uh, for the worship response, please? So I don't know where this lands for you. But I do want to challenge you and invite you and ask you to consider just letting the Spirit do with you what He wants to do with you. Why don't you just relinquish control? Why don't you just for a second stop trying to do it on your own? Why don't you just for a second believe the earthly things so that you can also believe in the spiritual things? Why don't you move from a clenched fist to an open fist to an open arm embrace? Because that's what that baby needs. That baby needs an embrace and safety. That baby cannot hold on to anything. The world we live in makes us believe that the harder we clench our fists and the more in control we are, the better our lives will be. If you believe that, it'll come up short. I promise you. If you believe that, you'll be found wanting. 
I promise you. But if you believe this, then maybe today is the day that you should open up your hands and go, God, I'm really struggling not to be in control. I'm really struggling not to call the shots. I'm really struggling to just relinquish control to you and run to you and extend my arms to you. But I know more than anything that that is what I need. I want to be made new and I want to be revitalized. I want to be born of the Spirit. I want to start over inside and out. I want to be a baby who deeply needs your care and your affection and your love. I don't want to be an adult in my faith who thinks that I need to keep everything together. Why don't we just start there this morning? Let's take this time to respond and worship with Nero. Let me do a prayer for us now and then we'll read a benediction after worship. Lord Jesus, we are thankful for this word. We are thankful for your wisdom, for your invitation, for your love and for your grace. We are thankful that you spoke so clearly and we are thankful that you were lifted up as our Savior when you were crucified. We thank you that it is so easy and that it's so free that it is attainable for us. And we thank you that this has been your heart always to save your people, to not have them perish, and to not condemn them. May we hear this truth this morning. May it revitalize us. I pray for every one of us that has a clenched fist. Loosen, loosen, loosen our fists. Holy Spirit, this morning. Have us relinquish control to you and blow us around like you want to. For we know that that is the life. That is everlasting life. That is why you died. That is why you came. And that is what you want to do with us. So have your way among us as we respond in worship. Amen.